Hey, Mr. P here. In this video, we are going to talk about the physical requirements that all bacteria need in order to grow effectively. Um, there are a variety of physical and chemical requirements, but this video is going to pertain to the physical requirements only. So let's go. When you look at the requirements for growth, you can see that there is a division between the physical and chemical requirements. Obviously, the physical requirements are more like physical uh, environmental issues that a bacteria cell needs to overcome in order to grow successfully. Chemical requirements would be things that they require that are elemental or molecular. Okay. Again, in this video, we're going to focus only on the physical requirements. In the next video, we'll follow up with the chemical requirements. Just didn't want it to get too long. And so let's dive into the physical requirements. The first physical requirement that all bacteria need in order to grow effectively and successfully is a proper uh, temperature range. Um, there are a variety of different temperature ranges that a variety of different bacteria groups will grow in. Um, and you can see those. Obviously, you'll see these terms like psychrophiles and psychotrophs, mesophiles, thermophiles, and hyperthermophiles. But all bacteria, regardless of what uh, group they're in, have a minimum growth temperature, an optimum growth temperature, and a maximum growth temperature. So in this particular example, we're talking about the thermophiles. These are heat-loving bacteria. Now there are hyperthermophiles, which are even more heat tolerant and, and heat uh, requiring, but thermophiles are going to be relatively high temps, and you will see that according to this graph, the minimum growth temperature that these particular bacteria, or the bacteria that belong to this group of bacteria, require a minimum growth temperature of 40 degrees Celsius. They have an optimum uh, growth temperature of about 61 to 62 degrees. And they have a maximum growth temperature of about 70 to 73 degrees. Okay, again, 73 degrees Celsius. All of the bacteria within the group of bacteria called thermophiles are going to grow effectively uh, within the range of 40 to 73 degrees Celsius. Now, you can see that as the temperature increases from 40, regardless of group or regardless of class you're talking about, as you increase from the minimum growth temp, obviously growth rates are going to increase to an optimum. And then when you pass optimum and continue on increasing the temp, they will steadily decline until you reach the maximum growth temp. Um, it's important to note what bacteria species you're talking about and what bacterial class or, or temperature class, what the temperature requirements are for your particular bacteria. Um, when you're culturing bacteria, you need to know which type of bacteria it is so that you know what temperature to keep the incubator at. Um, typically, um, bacteria that cause disease are going to be kind of in this group, okay, mesophiles. Why? Because optimum growth temperature is right in the 37 degrees Celsius, and that pertains to body temp. So these are your bacteria that are going to grow really well inside of a host organism like a human uh, that has an internal body temperature of, of 37 degrees Celsius. Okay, a little bit more about these groups. The psychrophiles, which is the coldest group, uh, grows between negative 10 degrees Celsius and around 10 to 17 degrees Celsius. Again, that is going to be very cold. It's found mostly in the ocean's depths where temperatures are really cold. Um, those are bacteria that will not ever, in under any circumstance, re, uh, develop disease in a host. Okay, They just don't grow well in temperatures that are above 17 degrees Celsius, which is well under what um, endo, endomorphs um, and, and warm-blooded organisms uh, stay at. Moving up the temperature range a little bit, you go to your psychrotrophs. Okay, That's the next uh, class of bacteria. They grow between 0 and about 30 degrees Celsius. They cause food spoilage because they grow rapidly in refrigerated temperatures. Now, um, I don't know, we don't in the States use uh, Celsius, to, you know, cel degree Celsius very often, but hopefully you can appreciate that you keep your, uh, your refrigerator probably in the 36 to 38 degrees Fahrenheit range, okay? Um, that's obviously not quite to freezing. We don't want to freeze our food. We just want to keep the temperature low enough to inhibit as many of these bacteria as we can so that we can prolong the life of our food. Psychrotrophs, you'll see, grow very, very rapidly 
in about 20 degrees, 20 to 25 degrees Celsius. Um, these are the organisms that cause food spoilage because they can grow in the uh, not only uh, refrigerated kind of temperature zone, but they can also grow rapidly while food is sitting out and cooling down to room temp. Okay, room temperature is about 27 degrees. Okay, um, and so room temperature would be right in here. Obviously, at room temp, these these bacteria grow really fast as well. So if food sits out for a while, these are the bacteria that is causing um, that food to go bad. Mesophiles, like I said before, mesophiles they grow between 10 and about 47 degrees Celsius. They are the most common type of microbe, and they are the most beneficial and pathogenic bacteria on the planet because their optimal temperature matches the internal temp of their host. These are the bacteria that are causing disease in animals and humans. Okay, moving on, thermophiles. We're going into the higher, kind of the upper end of our temperature range. Obviously, these are going to grow between 40 and about 70 degrees Celsius. Remember, body temp was right around 37 degrees, and boiling is 100 degrees. So these are um, kind of moving on past body temp. They're not going to grow in a host at all uh, because their optimum um, is up here in the 60 degrees, but their minimum is right about 40 degrees. So that is obviously above what we keep our internal temperature at. And so they're going to grow in high temperatures like hot springs. And these bacteria um, are able to withstand high temperatures because they produce endospores. And those endospores, which we've talked about in previous chapters, uh, happen to be very heat resistant, which means even if the bacteria dies because the temperature uh, raises too high um, or rises too high, they can still produce these endospores, which will stay dormant and very heat resistant until temperatures come down a bit, kind of come back down into the optimal range, and it allows them to proliferate at a really high rate. These are not considered a public health problem because they are going to grow in uh, temperatures that are above what we keep our internal temperature at but they can survive heat treatment given to canned goods, and so they can spoil food and potentially produce toxins that can make the host sick, um, even though the active infection um, wouldn't exist. Okay, Moving on to the extreme uh, thermophiles. Hyperthermophiles are also called extreme thermophiles. These are the bacteria that are growing in a lot of cases above temperatures that are boiling. Okay, They actually grow above 100 degrees. Obviously, optimum is in the 90 to 100 degrees range, but they can grow up to um, up to about 110 degrees Celsius. These are typically members of a group of bacteria called archaea, and they live in hot springs that are associated with uh, volcanic activity that are very, very, very deep in the ocean. So deep underwater hydrothermic vents. Um, and, and because the pressures are so high in the deep vents, because they're underwater, um, it keeps the water from boiling, which is, is beneficial to them. So they're living in temperatures that are above boiling, but they're not living in boiling conditions because the pressures are so great. Okay, So that is kind of a temperature. Now, when we look at these different classes, obviously now we can look at thermometers, and I have kind of a side-by-side um, -side comparison between degrees Celsius, which we've been talking about, and degrees Fahrenheit, which you're probably more familiar with. There is, in both cases, a danger zone, what we call kind of in the public health sector the danger zone, because this is where the rapid growth of bacteria um, occurs. The danger zone is between 50 and about 15 degrees Celsius. To put that in perspective, that is around 130 degrees to about 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Now you guys know that you know room temperature somewhere between 70 and 75 degrees. So room temperature is in here. We cook our food up into this region. Now the region we cook food up to above 160 is because it will kill all bacteria that are potentially um, present in the food. Okay, that's one reason why they say make sure you always cook thoroughly meat products because meat um, can harbor bacteria. You always cook above this line because you want to kill all bacteria associated with the food. Now, as the food starts, um, you take the food off the burner, you take it off of the grill, whatever, it will immediately start to cool down. And if you leave food out long enough, it will continually cool down until it reaches 
um, this, this room temperature. Room temperature is kind of right in the middle of the danger zone. And so while this temperature has been cooling off in the food, it has been harboring um, proliferating bacteria. Bacteria can rapidly grow in this range. Okay, and if they grow very rapidly, not only are the numbers of bacteria going to increase kind of exponentially, but they're going to potentially produce toxins, which when eaten or consumed is going to make you sick. Okay, that's what food poisoning is. Food poisoning most of the time isn't due to an active infection of the bacteria that you consume. Uh, food poisoning is often the result of bacteria that are present in the food that are producing toxins that when consumed make you ill. Okay. Now, uh, past the, the danger zone, you further uh, cool food off by putting in the refrigerator. Notice the refrigerator is usually right in here. Again, we are not going below freezing because that's not the purpose of a refrigerator. That's the purpose of the freezer. But when you cool down to uh, refrigerated temperatures, it slows the growth of organisms, but it doesn't stop the growth of organisms. The only thing that will stop the growth of organisms is... Uh, putting it in the freezer. That's why food put in the freezer has a longer shelf life than food that is sitting in your refrigerator. Okay, really important to note because you don't want to get sick. Now, when we look at how um, masses cool off or how different food items cool off, you will see that when we measure refrigeration, the refrigeration can kind of cycle on and off, and so you have some kind of cyclic. Um, Kind of up and down cycles of the refrigerator but for the most part refrigerator stays pretty common uh, or pretty consistent and it is usually right above zero degrees celsius again zero degrees celsius would be freezing and so we are keeping our refrigerator at about four degrees celsius okay if you put food that is only two inches deep basically you don't put it too deep you spread it out in a pan you will notice that it actually cools off very 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 quickly and will actually reach um, refrigerated temperatures at about the four hour mark. Okay, so it cools off really, really rapidly and it reaches kind of that, um, that slow growth zone at about four hours. On the contrast, if you put the same amount of food but you put it really um, tall, okay, or you, you have a lot of mass, you don't allow the temperature to dissipate as quickly, you will see that the temperature doesn't decrease as fast and actually may never get to uh, the temperature in a very safe amount of time. This is obviously the danger zone we talked about. Okay, This particular dish was in the danger zone for approximately, you know, from the 30 minute mark to the one and a half hour mark. So it was only in the danger zone for an hour. Okay, that's what this uh, this graph is showing you. It was only within that danger zone for an hour. Um, after it got out of the, the danger zone, it was slowing the growth of organisms and so it's, it's much safer in terms of consumption. This bigger container um, gets down into the kind of danger zone at hour three maybe three hours, 15 minutes, and it doesn't actually get out of the danger zone until the eight hour mark. Okay, so you're talking basically one, two, three, four, potentially five hours of bacterial growth in this dish when you put them both in the refrigerator at the same time. This dish is gonna potentially have substantially more bacteria in it and can produce toxins and can make you ill a lot sooner than this one did just based on the way you packaged it. So that's something to keep into consideration as you're packing up food. Okay, so that was temperature. pH scale um, obviously is a scale that ranges from 0 to 14, 0 being very acidic and 14 being very alkaline or very basic. 7 is right in the middle and that is our neutral point. You guys have seen the pH scale before. But uh, the pH is one of those uh, physical requirements for growth because it can definitely impact the way bacteria grow. Most bacteria grow between 6.5 and 7.5, so it makes sense. Most bacteria grow going to grow in um, what we consider kind of neutral environments. They can be slightly acidic at 6.5 and they can be slightly alkaline at 7.5, but for the most part, they grow uh, right around neutral. 
Acidophiles are bacteria that are acid loving and they grow in very low pHs and they can be very tolerant to very low pHs. So they grow in very acidic environments. Alkalinity is usually not conducive to microbial growth, which is why a lot of household cleaners have a very, very high pH. It's one of the ways they inhibit microbial growth. It's one of the ways they are active um, cleaning agents when you're trying to disinfect surfaces. But alkalinity also inhibits microbial growth, but is rarely used to preserve foods just because it's not very conducive to food preservation. But it is good for cleanliness and products that are going to sterilize and disinfect surfaces. Okay, When bacteria are cultured in the lab, they often produce acids that eventually interfere with their own growth. And so as a bacteria colony grows, they're going to produce compounds that make the environment more acidic. So the bigger a colony gets, the lower the pH goes, and they eventually can actually produce pHs that they can't tolerate, and they eventually kind of kill themselves based on producing the acid that makes it not conducive to growth. To neutralize the acids and maintain the proper pH, chemical buffers are included in the growth medium, and so when you guys make agar or you make uh, broth, they have buffers in place which are designed to withstand uh, pH changes. It's just kind of something that's important to note. The last physical requirement we're going to talk about is osmotic pressure. We've talked about it a little bit in past videos, but you guys know that osmosis is the movement of water from an area of high kind of water concentration to an area of low water concentration. So water is going to follow a natural concentration gradient. Areas that have high water are going to naturally have lower solute concentrations, and areas that have uh, lower water concentrations are going to have naturally higher solute concentrations. So when you put a cell, which is in this case 0.85% salt into a solution that is 10% salt, obviously there is higher concentrations of NaCl in this environment. Water is going to move out of the cell because it's going to go from where there is more water to where there is less water. Water falling its natural concentration gradient is trying to maintain equilibrium, and this cell is going to lose water. It's going to shrivel up. It's going to lose mass. Uh, the water is going to leave the plasma membrane, and that is what we call plasmolysis. Okay, Hypertonic environments, high solutes rather than the inside of the cell cause plasmolysis due to high osmotic pressure. It basically tells uh, the cell to lose the water because the water is trying to balance out uh, the original 1% on the inside to the 10% on the outside. They'll equal out at maybe 5%, right? There are what we call extreme or obligate halophiles, which are bacteria that require very high osmotic pressures, and they actually can live in extremely salty uh, environments. Um, obviously, bacteria that live in the ocean are going to be more halophilic than uh, bacteria that live in fresh water. Um, there are other environments in soils that are close to the ocean or, or close to the beach that have higher, naturally higher solute concentrations or salt concentrations. Those bacteria have to be able to withstand very high salt concentrations. Um, and it's not just living in the presence of salt. It's living in the presence of salt, but also having the uh, physical attributes in place to not lose uh, water through osmotic pressure. We also have what is called facultative halophiles, which are very tolerant to high osmotic pressures, but they usually don't prefer high solute concentrations. They actually prefer to live in very low salt concentrations, but they're able to withstand or tolerate high osmotic pressures when those particular environmental conditions exist. Okay, So to wrap it up, the physical requirements we talked about are temperature, Osmotic pressure and pH, those three are very important requirements for the growth of microorganisms. In the next video, we're going to follow this up with the chemical requirements, which is going to talk through all of these uh, items on the right. Um, so stay tuned. See you later.